This is your friend and favorite neighborhood, Sophie. Sophie, I am here today with another Ask Sophie response. I've received a really deep and profound question from a friend of mine on Facebook named Jamie. And I wanted to, as usual, give this a lot of thought and give it a lot of research. And I have done so, and I'm rushing this out. I thought we'd have a little late night conversation about it because we are one day away from election day in the biggest, most consequential election of, I think, any of our lives. And so I wanted to go ahead and answer his question in the vein of reproductive health because it's such a pivotal issue in this election. So let's just jump right in. This is not, uh, a lecture in the sense of I'm trying to tell you what to do or tell you what's right or wrong. Um, I'm genuinely wanting to hopefully offer a safe space of understanding. So with that being said, the question that I was asked was, do you really think it's okay to allow abortions in all nine months of pregnancy? And yeah, the short answer is yes. And I will, of course, qualify and explain and detail why I feel that it's perfectly fine. But just before we jump into those explanations and answers, let's have a little bit of housekeeping. So before we even jump in, I know this topic is going to elicit comments that are more negative, but again, we're this is not the space for that. So if you see someone who obviously has not watched this video (laughs) in part or in whole, and you're seeing some vitriolic language or just sumptive language, please reply to that person's comment with Mamala. And if you even want to go a step further and find the timestamp for where they might have actually received the answer to their question or comment, that'd be amazing if you could put Mamala in a timestamp so that person can hopefully just be prompted to actually watch a video before they make a comment on it. This will probably be pretty lengthy. So the way that I'm going to break it up, just so you know, is we're going to talk about your understanding of what abortion is and how it came to be and how people's reproductive rights came under attack. Then we're going to move into addressing pro-lifers' fears and in a genuine and honest and and thoughtful way, I hope. Uh, and then after that, we'll talk about perhaps some solutions for moving together in this in this whole new paradigm of thinking once we again hopefully come to where we can be on the same page with this topic. So again, yeah, if you are seeing some negativity, just reply with Mamala and again, a timestamp if you like. I, even though there, I know there's going to be some comments that are negative, hate just genuinely will not be tolerated. So if there's somebody who's saying something that's obviously just to be raid or be mean, those comments will just be deleted. So don't waste your time. Um, furthermore, if you're if you made it this far, great. But if you're watching and you just, your objective is to spew derision and meanness and unkindness, then this is not the place for you. I will say that I am approaching this entire conversation with the belief and knowledge that you are a good person. You are a good person. When it comes to the abortion debate, if you're pro-choice, I absolutely believe you're a good person because you want women to be able to have control over their bodies. If you're pro-life, you are a good person because you genuinely care about babies and life. And that's a beautiful thing. And so I don't want to discount that. Nobody's angry at that. Um, so we'll, I want to delicately address your concerns throughout this video. So um, again, if you have any questions, comments, or thoughts, please leave them below. I don't know if you've heard of a phenomenon called the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's essentially where you have a little bit of information. And so 
you you don't realize that there's a lot more complexity to it. So you might actually feel very knowledgeable or certain about a topic when in actuality, once you get more information, you start to realize that, hey, maybe this is a little bit more complicated than I initially thought. And so that's my objective with this, again, is to delicately, thoughtfully, kindly address the topic of abortion, but also to hopefully move you from a position of feeling very staunch in your thinking to coming to a place of, hey, this is a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more nuanced than I might have originally thought. Okay. So with that being said, sometimes opinions can be wrong. Everybody's, I'm a very avid First Amendment proponent, Second Amendment proponent. I'm very much a a pro-Constitution gal. But when it comes to free speech, freedom of speech doesn't mean that you can just say whatever you want. You can. It just means that the government can't go after you for talking bad about the government. But it doesn't mean that you can issue statements or say things that are demonstratively false or harmful, especially not without being checked on it. Okay. So you can have the opinion that the sky is yellow or orange or whatever. And I'm sure at certain times it may be, but for the most part, if you go around thinking that one plus one is three, like Terrence Howard, you're just not going to convince many people of that. And it's just a fact that opinions can be wrong. So if you can accept that truth and understand that some of your opinions, especially if you're on the pro-life side of things, will be challenged as we move forward through this video. Just try to sit in that place of discomfort and knowing that it's okay. We're going to come to a place of hopefully, again, calmness and acceptance with what we learn as we start talking about uh, the topic at hand. So just be open. If you're a person who just, you cannot Accept the fact that, again, there's a little bit more complexity and nuance to this, then don't just don't. This is going to be a long video. I don't want you to waste your time or my time. Just go watch some TikTok or go back to your silo. It's perfectly fine. But if you're willing to, again, challenge your thinking a little bit, let's keep going. And another topic in that vein is that two things can be true at one time. And we'll, talk about this as we move forward and instances where this is happening, where somebody can be pro-choice and (laughs) anti-abortion. It's possible. I'm that way. I definitely believe women should have the right to choose, but I wish nobody had to have an abortion. And I'd love for there to be systems and laws and practices in place that facilitate sex education and contraception so that nobody ever has to have an abortion. So it's something to try to keep in mind that even people who might have an opposing thought from you, they might be a little closer to your thinking than you might assume. So again, two things can be true at one time, and we'll talk about some instances where that occurs. Now, if your whole life, (laughs) your whole identity is surrounded or caught up in the fact that pro-life is just your, that's your thing. Again, you probably don't want to sit here and listen to me because I'm going to be challenging those, those beliefs and those opinions. And so if it's something where it's going to rock you to the core (laughs) and challenge who you are as a person, again, just, you might want to sit this one out. I'll show you a couple of examples of people who I don't see ever watching this or benefiting from this. Um, All right. So I saw this girl. I was really trying to look at some of her reposts and favorites. Again, just to understand what her thinking was, because she's very pro-life, very Christian, and, you know, very anti-trans, anti-LGB, Trumper kind of person. So I, you know, I do that sometimes. I just try to understand the other side of my thinking sometimes. And same with this person. As you can see, every single post is pro-life and abortion is bad. And so if, if this is you, 
you know, I get it if you want to just go ahead and turn this off. Because <laughs> we're not going to, we're probably not going to make much headway <laughs> with each other here. But if you're somebody who can actually, again, disassociate the pro-life stance as an identity, then I think we can, again, start to try to come to some consensus. I also want to talk today about why you might hold those really deep-seated beliefs and who may be benefiting from those. You might be a little surprised to learn some of these things. So again, if you're not ready to have your world shaken up a little bit here, then I'll see you later. Thanks for joining in. But if you're ready to dive into this whole crazy world of abortion and pro-life and pro-choice and reproductive rights, then come along with me. (laughs) But first, let's really dig into your understanding of abortion, what it is, what it isn't, just genuinely giving you a definition and then explaining some of the nuance in just the definition alone. So abortion is simply the termination of a pregnancy by removal or expulsion of an embryo or fetus. And that sounds really succinct, but even in this tiny little definition, there's so much we can break down. So the termination of a pregnancy, it could be something that's elective where a person who is pregnant might choose to end their pregnancy. It might be that the pregnancy itself was non-viable. The actual term for miscarriage is an abortion by miscarriage. So abortion could just genuinely mean that the pregnancy has stopped in some way. The fetus could actually have passed. It's not that an abortion always has to deal with a living fetus or living embryo. So sometimes people aren't aware of that or they think that every instance of abortion is killing a living being, and that's just not true. So abortions can mean that you are stopping the process of conception. So abortion can technically be like a plan B, morning after pill, where you're just stopping the egg from the egg and sperm that have already connected from implanting. So that's a, a way to abort. Also, abortion doesn't necessarily mean that you have to kill your fetus. If you have waited until your baby is viable, or if you're past like the 22, 23, 24 week point, you can actually have an abortion performed that is either done by induction or by what is called hysterotomy. So it's basically like a C-section. So you can have abortions that aren't intended to harm the fetus. So abortion, it's a very loaded word where you hear it and you immediately think, oh, you're killing a baby. But again, sometimes the baby's already gone. Sometimes the baby can be saved. So there's a lot of situations and instances that can occur with this world. And so again, it's a lot more nuanced than people initially think when they hear the word. I want to talk to you about how pregnancy works. I have a little video clip that I want to play for you just because it it gives a quick overview of it because I don't think a lot of people know. I hate to admit, but I didn't, before I read the whole what to expect when you're expecting and did the research when I was trying to conceive myself, I didn't realize some of these little nuances. Here we go. The first few weeks of what is counted as your pregnancy, you're not pregnant yet. This is the time between the first day of your last period and when you ovulate and conceive. Over the next several days, the fertilized egg will start dividing into multiple cells as it travels down the fallopian tube, enters your uterus, and burrows into the uterine lining. You're now about four weeks from the beginning of your last period. And there's also, before the blastocyst, burrows into your uterus. I don't know why I just thought like it's floating in your uterus and then the umbilical cord somehow is connected to the placenta, which all just grows in the uterus. No, your egg and your sperm come together. They make the zygote or they make the blastocyst, excuse me. And then it actually has to like hatch. 
this one isn't showing it. I'll add a description to a video that's way more detailed than this, but actually shows the blastocyst like hatching out of an egg casing and then burrowing into the uterine lighting, which again, I had no idea. But that process of it burrowing into the uterine lining can sometimes create spotting, which can sometimes, again, be an early indicator of pregnancy. But it's very hard to know that you're pregnant at this stage. So just this uh, ball of cells going. called a blastocyst has begun to produce the pregnancy hormone HCG. This hormone tells your ovaries to stop releasing eggs and can be detected by a pregnancy test. After like a four mere 16 to five days weeks, after conception, three, four your fetus's neural plate yeah. forms. Think of it as the foundation of your baby's brain and spinal cord. The neural plate folds onto itself to form the neural tube, which closes by about week six of pregnancy to eventually become the brain and spinal cord. Begin to develop. Organs such as the brain, sensory organs, and the digestive tract begin to take shape. Your baby has what looks like a little tail. It will recede after a few weeks and form the tailbone. At three months pregnant, the embryo already has a human appearance. The limbs, hands, feet, fingers, and toes are recognizable. And this is three months in, Their and skin it's still is so called thin an embryo. You can see the blood vessels beneath it. Though reproductive organs have begun to form, they can't yet be determined on an ultrasound or sonogram. By the end of the third month, your baby is fully formed. And this they weigh is about the point an ounce and are four now inches long. A fetus. Since your baby's most critical development has occurred, your chance of miscarriage drops considerably after three months into the pregnancy. Second trimester, very fine wisps of hair appear on your baby's body. This is called lanugo and plays a She's critical really role dark. in protecting the fetus from damaging substances found in amniotic fluid. Your baby's senses, smell, vision, touch, taste, and hearing are developing, and they may be able to hear your voice. Your baby's eyelids are still fused shut, but they can sense light. If you shine a flashlight on your tummy, they'll move away from the beam. Their movements have gone from flutters to full-on kicks and jabs against the walls of your womb. Ultrasounds done at four months pregnant may reveal your baby's sex. Here you are in your seventh month of this pregnancy. You've come a long Ugh. way. <laughs> During the third hell. trimester, your fetus continues to grow in size and weight. Your baby's lungs are beginning to reach maturity, meaning your baby would have a good chance of surviving if born now. That's when they Starting in week 36, which your baby gains about lungs. half a pound and it grows half an inch a week. Many babies turn head down and stay in that position until birth. So that's just a very quick overview of, yeah, very quick overview of just how pregnancy works. I furthermore would like to show you what that looks like in a woman's body. So sorry, it looks a little nudie nude, but it's just the side profile. At this point, it's not even there. It's just the egg and sperm in the first one to two weeks. So then now you have where the baby has implanted in the first three weeks, four weeks, five weeks. Sorry, I'm trying to show you. Six weeks. And so this is when <laughs> a lot of states have abortion bans at six weeks. There's nothing like how there's no way to even know. So they're effectively abortion bans in total because there's just no way you're really going to know anything's there at six weeks, seven weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks, 11 weeks, 12 weeks, 13 weeks, 14 weeks, and 15 weeks is another marker where a lot of states will have a cutoff. Their abortions will be unavailable after 15 weeks. And as you can see, there, you're not even showing yet. There's not, there's really no way to know, excuse me, even that for maybe a few weeks before that. Yeah, so it's tricky. So after, I'd say about four weeks, if you suspect that you are pregnant, then you can get a test and see if you are or not. But you, if you don't know the signs, if you have some, like I have PCOS, my Periods are extremely irregular. If you're an athlete, your periods could be irregular. You you just you might be pregnant for this long and never have any indication that you are actually pregnant. So the fact that there are abortion bans that cut off women before they might even know that they're pregnant is pretty abysmal. So let's just move on so you can see 
how it looks. I'll skip to 20 and 23. This is a very important week for me. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And let's move to, sorry, and 23 is another, 21 is another cutoff for some abortion bans. Let's see, 28. And baby's pretty solidly viable, definitely at this point. And then I'd say right at about 36 weeks is when you're getting really close to a term pregnancy. 38 weeks is solidly a term pregnancy. 40 weeks is the exact amount of time that the term is supposed to be. Some pregnancies do go into 42 weeks. After that point, it's very dangerous. You actually do want to try to actually induce your baby after 42 weeks. But that's the pregnancy life cycle. Psst. Thanks for watching, but make sure you subscribe. All right, back to the video. I want to play a little game with you. I'm going to show you two six week embryos. So just be aware you're going to see some embryos for the next little bit here. And I want you to guess which one is human. Okay. So if you want to throw a comment or just guess in your head, which one do you think is human? Whichever one you have guessed, I'll let you know if you were right or wrong. Here you go. Yeah. So the one on the right is a human embryo. The one on the left is a dolphin embryo. And let me show you something that, that I just thought was so hilarious. It's not very nice, but it's, I think it's funny. So I'm going to show it. Do you truly in your heart of hearts truly believe that this is a human being? This without a doubt. Without a doubt? Yes. This is a dolphin fetus. Let me without a doubt, a dolphin so fetus is a human being. This is a human being. You just confirmed that a dolphin, in, in life, you can use dolphins for human baby nothing. So let me you go to Sea World and you're like, someone got human babies in that aquarium. Yeah, I just think that's hilarious because Charlie Kirk is like a huge pro life guy. and But he takes it to the extent of only really talking to like really young people about it. So I don't think he actually gets real challenge when it comes to some of his thinking. So to see him get cooked like that was so just satisfying, really satisfying. So yeah. So if you didn't get it right, so he didn't either. So don't feel so bad. But let's move on. Let's play another round. Okay. I'm going to give you some more options. Now this was a six week embryo. The next ones I'm going to show you are the equivalent of nine weeks in human terms. So these, this would be a nine-week human embryo somewhere in here. So you have to guess which one it is. And let's see. I'll put the whole thing up so you can really take a good look. All right. So do you have your answer locked in? Let's see. Is it this guy? Nope, that's a mouse. Is it this guy? Nope, that's an elephant. This guy is a dog. Did you pick the next one? That one's a bat. And this one is the human. So well done, well done, well done. If you picked the human, which is really hard to do. It's really hard to do. Because at this stage, again, this is nine weeks. This is well past when... A lot of abortion bans that are put in place in America, th this is not even identifiable as a human baby. I just thought that would be a fun little exercise. And then also take a look at this map. So before America went to hell, we were looking pretty good. Like we had so much reproductive freedom. Abortions were legal pretty much upon request, especially when they were most needed. Because even under Roe versus Wade, states were able to put some restrictions in the second trimester and even more in the third trimester. But for the most part, now, if we were to update this map, we've now been relegated to third world country status, which I think is absolutely abhorrent. And so that really sucks. That just really sucks. So let's move on and chit chat a little bit about. Again, what 
abortion is and where I think some of the key factors where we can find some common ground with pro-choice, pro-lifers might be. We're going to really have to come to a consensus about when life begins or when an abortion matters. I guess. It's going to be around sentience. As you can see, the, the embryos you just looked at, they're alive. They're living tissue. They're definitely, even though they don't look like it at that point, they're, if it's in a pregnant person's body, it's a human being. It is a human life. But when does it become viable? When does it matter? When does it become, okay, this is now you're technically like killing a being, you know? I don't think it's at the heartbeat. I don't think it's at the point of conception. I, and I think a lot of other pro-choice people and a lot of other medical professionals believe that it's at the stage of sent. And what sentience is, it's the capacity to experience feelings and have cognitive abilities, such as awareness and emotional reactions. In other words, this is the point at which your baby starts to feel and can feel pain. And so that's the point where it's okay. It, it gets a little abhorrent to do anything to harm that life or that being at that point because it could actually experience that pain. And that point happens at some point between the 23 and 24, 25 week point of gestation. And I, I don't know if you recall, I said at the 23 mark, just to show you one more time. So again, six weeks, that's where the embryos that you saw were at, with the dolphin and human one. And then nine weeks is where you saw the doggy and elephant one. But yeah, 23 weeks is about when, somewhere in that span is when babies start to have the brain development and neurological development in place to actually experience pain. And so that's the point at which I actually delivered my daughter and her name is Day. So let me tell you a little bit about my kid. <laughs> and okay, so this is tricky for me because it is all such a crazy time, but I was at 23 weeks and five days gestation when I delivered my daughter. She was a breech birth, came out feet first. My, I look back at my charts and my, my hospital notes and everything, and it said that my actual third stage delivery time was five minutes. Like, so she was ready. She was cup. I want to show you some pictures of her when she was first born. So just be aware you're going to see a very early premature, super premature baby. This is her when she was first born. And as soon as she came out, she had to be wrapped in this plastic sheeting. They had to put like ventilator down her throat. They had to put lines in her umbilical cord to access her veins and her di digestive systems. And so, as you can see, it was very scary. It was a really a wild situation. This is her after she got settled a little bit. I was able to hold her hand. She was actually able to hold my hand. And she's just tiny. She was born at 600 grams, which is like 1.2 pounds. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. And then this is a much better picture of her. And you can see the actual Lanugo, where she was so early. You can see her veins, her melanin hasn't even kicked in so you could really see through her skin it was translucent her tiny little diapers it was funny now but at the time it was so wild to see like even her little there's no fat on her nothing so like her butt it's weird the things you remember at these times but her butt was just like a little hole there was no cheeks nothing I just thought that was so crazy and then yeah so I'm like so I'm effectively looking at my fetus but 23 weeks five days and then this is what she looked like with me holding her. That's just how tiny she was. And so I'm sharing all of this to impress upon you kind of two sides of a single coin here. 
So on the one hand, yes, it's amazing that at 23 weeks of life, a, a baby is viable and they can be removed from the mother and have a, a fair chance of surviving. Now, her survival rate was estimated to be like something like 14%. And even then they were like, oh, she'll most likely have some learning delays and some uh, neurological challenges. So far, things seem to be okay. But yeah, so babies are viable at 23 weeks. There are ways to have an abortion where you can save the baby. So that's the kind of the one side of it that is so, I don't know, helpful with the pro-choice argument. Yes, you can, you can perform abortions that save the baby that early, potentially. On the other hand, and I think the other side of that coin is going to be that there, there was so much that had to be done to keep her alive that it, it kind of illustrates, I think, the fact that babies that are born that early they're really not viable. They're really not viable outside the mother's womb. So it really goes to show just how much it, it's the mom's body. It's the pregnant person's body that is the most, I hate to say it like that, but you really don't have the ability to live without so much intervention. So it's, so up until 22, 23 weeks, it, I think it's fair to say that it's the woman's right to choose if she doesn't want to carry a baby for any reason, because it's her body that is the only thing keeping this entity alive, really. So there's, again, just to share Day's story, it's just hopefully to illustrate, again, more nuance and complexity in this argument that on one hand, yeah, and then on the other hand, huh. So that's my baby. And I would love to show you her picture. This is her at six months. And her birthday is actually in 10 days. And so she'll be one years old in 10 days. And this is her with her big sister today. This was taken, I think, earlier today. So she's growing so well. She's about 18 pounds now, so from 600 grams, 1.2 pounds to seven and a half uh, kilograms and almost 18 pounds now. She is doing really well. We were in the hospital for 111 days, and then she came home on oxygen. She came home with all these medications, and now it's like we have a regular old kid. Like, she's amazing. She doesn't really require any intervention. She has like a special formula she takes and that's it. So we got extremely lucky. But just to update you on how she's doing, she's perfect. So yeah, that's my baby. So that's why, again, sentience and viability are very important and they really do kick in again around that 23-week mark. I did want to say that sentience is not consciousness. It's not awareness. And so I've gotten the question, oh, well, the baby's life should only really be taken into consideration after sentience. Then what about if I'm asleep? You're just going to kill me if I'm asleep? It's like, no, no, no. Sentience is very different. It's just the, it's just the capacity to feel pain or have emotions or to experience feelings. That's it. So it's not, if you can imagine like somebody being brain dead, you, the whole Terry Shivo argument all over again, I guess, because again, we're in this land of complexity and nuance. Um, but if somebody's brain dead, there's nothing, there's no sentience, there's no capacity for feeling. So there's no feeling of pain. There's no, because I think her brain was even starting to leak out of her nose at one point or something crazy. So uh, the Terry Shivo situation. So, so when it comes to somebody being brain dead and you're just, having them on life support to keep their body alive, that's not living. That's not sentience. So the protocol in the hospital, if somebody's brain dead, is to let them go. It's cruel to keep their body alive and just deteriorating while there's nothing going on in there. And it's not 
It's not being in a coma. If you're in a coma and you still have brain activity, then you can wake up at any point. Or even if you don't wake up, you still have the capacity for feeling pain or feeling if you, if it's, even if it's in your subconscious or in your dream state. So it's not being in a coma. It's being brain dead or, again, not having developed the brain or neurology to even experience those feelings. Yeah, and it's not being asleep. It's not being knocked out. So just wanted to share the difference between sentience and consciousness before we move on. Hi, like and subscribe, please. Thank you. All right, bye. Back to the video. Some of the different types of abortions that you can have. We talked a little bit about emergency contraception. That's not an abortion. Those are just emergency contraceptions, but technically. <laughs> Because again, we're in this land of nuance. Nickly, the the life has already, it's just, so you have the zygote, the blastocyst that's formed. Emergency contraception just m prevents it from implanting. But when it comes to abortive contraceptive medications like mifepristone and things like that, those actually stop the pregnancy that's already established. You also have labor induction, where if you're far enough along, it, you can actually take medication to induce your body to expel your pregnancy. There are then surgical options, and those are called a lot of different things. First of all, you'll take medication to soften the cervix, and then they'll have a device go in to remove the actual fetal tissue. That's called a few things, vacuum aspiration, DNE, which stands for dilation and, and evacuation, or DNC, which stands for dilation and curatage. So they, I'm sure there's differences between those, but for the most part, that's when a pregnancy is vacuumed or sucked out of the uterus. Then you also have surgical options that are, like we talked about before, hysterotomies, which are effectively C-section. So the thing I want to talk about with those really quickly, though, is that with hysterotomy abortions, that is being used as a circumvent to some of these abortion bans. So women who are in their 19th, 20th, 23rd, 24th weeks of pregnancy and they have not been able to get any other sort of exceptions or help to have a medical or medicative abortion, they're now forced to have C-sections, essentially. When that is major abdominal surgery, it's done in a way that's at the top part of your belly, of your uterus, when you're performing a C-section that early sometimes prevents you from getting pregnant in the future, or at the very least, you will not be able to have a vaginal delivery if you have a C-section that high, but you have to have it that high when you're having it early. When I just want to give you a, a, a story I read about a woman who lived in a country in South America that, that has a no abortion policy, zero abortions, and she kept petitioning the government to make an exception that her life was in danger, her baby was non-viable, and then they said no. And so she had to get the C-section at 23 weeks, so the same age as my daughter. She had to get the C-section, and the baby lived for five days, basically drowning in its own unformed lungs for five fucking days. So it just... so. When C-sections are used to say, oh, well, at least the baby was intact. At least you didn't have to go in and do the abortions where you're having to crush and vacuum out the fetus because it's so big. At least you're, you're doing everything to maybe see if the baby's viable, even though you know it's not. There's all these like reasons that pro-lifers try to give to say, oh, well, the C-section abortion is better. And, it, and it's absolutely not. It's so unsafe. And then to force a baby to grow into the point of sentience and then force it to have to die slowly and feel that shit 
that is pure fucking evil. That is pure evil. So I highly disagree with forcing women to wait until, again, babies are at a state of sentience for forcing women to perform C-section abortions, especially when they know that the baby's un unviable. It's horrifying. So yeah, and we'll talk about some of those types of abortions as it pertains to the weeks. So again, 23 weeks after that point, you're pretty much going to have to do an induction or a hysterotomy abortion, which is great because in those instances where it's necessary, even if it's elective, which is just never happens, but even if it's elective, you have a good chance of the baby surviving if they were viable in the first place. But it just so rarely happens. But for the most part, after 10 weeks, you have to do a DNE, DNC. So let's start from the beginning. So zero, one to two weeks, you can do plan B. Usually that's like up to two, three days after you have potentially conceived. But one to two weeks, all the way up until 10 weeks, you can take a pill typically to end the abortion and you'll expel it like in your next menstrual cycle after that point. Or if there are complications and say you've had a miscarriage, but you haven't expelled your fetus yet, then you up until I want to say 15 weeks, you can have a DNE or DNC. And then after that, up until I want to say 23 weeks, you can have a DNA or DNC, but that's when I think they have to actually like crush the baby. It's gross, but they crush the baby at that point in order for it to be expelled. Yeah. So it's not very pleasant. But then after, but again, they're not, they don't feel it. There's nothing there to feel it. So then after about 22 weeks on, is when you can do the induction and hysterotomy abortions, where again, perhaps the, if the baby was viable, they can be saved. Now, we talked about pregnancy and what happens when pregnancies are perfect and they work great, but there's so many things that can happen to make it where a pregnancy doesn't go how you want. And in those instances, you still need abortions. So if your baby passes away or is non viable, you still need an abortion. It's not just people who are walking into the abortion clinic just for fun. Like, I don't understand why people think that's a thing that happens. We talked about some of the types of abortions and about when you need them or do them or perform them. And next, I want to talk about some really important statistics um, just to give you, again, a little bit more of an alleviation of some of your concerns before we move into your fears specifically. So approximately a little over half a million abortions are performed or they were in America before the Dobbs decision. But for the most part, yeah, th this is legal abortions. So in 2021, there were 626,000 legal abortions. The majority of those abortions, 93.5%, were performed within the first 13 weeks. 80% of those were before nine weeks. Only a very tiny percentage, about 5.7%, happened between weeks 14 and 20. And then less than 1% happened after 21 weeks. And again, those are usually cases where it has to be done. The baby's not viable. The mom gets preeclampsia or gestational diabetes, things that will absolutely harm the mother and harm the baby. So at that point, again, you can potentially do the non-abortions, which is, I think, gives some women some hope, especially if you're preeclamptic or something to that effect. So the early medication abortions. Uh, that used the pills were used in 53% of all cases. About 60% of women who seek abortions already have at least one child. And so that kind of 
flies in the face of this argument that you're not wanting to start a family or it's for selfish reasons that you don't want to have a baby. They have a family and they want to preserve that family. Let's see, approximately 50% of women, and I've seen different stats on this. I've seen between 25 and 50% of women who have abortions reported using contraception during the month that they became pregnant or using contraception when they uh, had sex. And so that flies in the face of the argument that, oh, people out here are just so irresponsible. If you just closed your legs, blah, blah, blah. No. Again, almost half the people who seek abortions have to have them because their contraception failed. So that's a huge point that I hope, again, actually makes you feel a little better. Like it's not the, the abuse of abortion just does not happen to the degree or the frequency that people seem to think. And again, if you have any questions about what I'm talking about or, or thoughts, uh, go ahead and leave them in the comments. Now, just a quick overview of what reproductive rights are and how they came to be and what kind of happened with the Dobbs decision. I'm already a good ways in on this. And so I'll try to be a little bit more quick from here on out. (laughs) But basically, Roe versus Wade was when the Supreme Court said that it's a woman's constitutional right to choose to have an abortion. This occurred again in 1973. The ruling was under the right to privacy under the 14th Amendment. And this basically established that states cannot impose undue restrictions on abortion access. Now, this is just during the first trimester. They actually gave states the ability to have some restrictions in the second and even more restrictions in the third trimester of pregnancy. But for the most part, Roe v. Wade said, listen, it's it's up to the women to make that determination for themselves. And then what happened in 2022 is that the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization decision reversed Roe versus Wade. It basically returned the authority to regulate or ban abortions altogether to individual states. And this limited access to, I think, all Southern states except for Virginia. And I think about 14 states altogether have some form of really draconian abortion ban. And so that's the long and short of it. Really, really sucks. (laughs) The reason that it sucks is because these bans that have been put in place, they don't do anything. They don't stop abortions from happening. What they do is they, they open the door for us to go back in time to when people performed dangerous abortions or they were taken advantage of and had to pay people to perform an unsafe abortion on them. There are stories of before Roe versus Wade of doctors who would take advantage of women, use dirty tools, back alley abortions, as you call them. Some women would try to abort their babies themselves by falling downstairs or taking supposed drugs or concoctions to end their pregnancy. I don't know if you've ever heard of the whole wire hanger thing. People would use knitting needles to basically go through their cervix to pop their amniotic sacs, which is horrendous. And so the thing about it is, even if you are able to break the waters or or break the amniotic sac, sometimes that does not actually stop the pregnancy. You can get an infection that way. If it does stop the pregnancy, that doesn't mean that the fetal tissue will automatically be removed. So you're setting yourself up for sepsis and all. I mean, it's dangerous. It is dangerous. So if a woman wants an abortion, she will get an abortion. And if she's unable to get one because she's in a situation where she's now starting to suffer the effects of the baby deteriorating or she's getting sepsis. Then you have situations where these women just, they die. So we're in a place in time where people are dying. They're being killed. And there's reports showing that it's unnecessary and it's horrifying. 
Of course, I think everybody's heard of Amber Nicole Thurman's case in Georgia, Candy Miller in Georgia, Jocely Barnica in Texas, and just last week, Nevaeh Crane in Texas was 19 years old when, or 18 or 19 when she died because they didn't get the help they needed with their pregnancies. And so it's insane. Another thing that happens that people don't think about is this the unaliving of one's selves. And I, I got to watch my language on this. I'm sorry. It's already probably too late. I've said so many words. I shouldn't. <laughs> For the censorship gods. Well, yeah, when it comes to unaliving oneself, I personally have two friends that I've lost in high school who unalived themselves because they got pregnant. And that would have been me. That would have been me. If I had gotten pregnant, I would, bye, I'm out. The way that my mother raised me in a very Christian, Presbyterian household, uh, she was the pastor's daughter. So she had this upstanding lifestyle that she had to present. And so, yeah, I would have been so ashamed. I would have, I would have been out, you know, and then again, I know people who had done that. So bans on abortion, they don't stop abortions. They don't stop women from dying. They don't stop people from unaliving themselves. So all it does is set us backwards and takes us back in time. It's absolutely horrendous. So with that being said, we've talked about your understanding of abortion and hopefully have given you much more detail into when it's necessary, what happens, the types of abortions, when they're needed. And again, the fact that they don't always end in the loss of life. But let's move on. I want to talk to you now. Again, we talked about your understanding. Did you know you can join sexwithsophie.com for free? That way you can ask me questions. We have all kind of community features. Come on, it's great. Sexwithsophie.com. Now back to the video. Let's talk about your anger. I really want you to understand why you have been made to feel so, so upset whenever a woman is trying to choose what's best for her. Like, here's why you've been made to feel like that concerns you. All right, so your anger. Now, this is Paul Weyrich, Weyrich, Paul somebody, Weyrich will say. He is a co-founder of the Heritage Foundation. So he'll come into play in a second. Let me just couch your anger in the fact that it's a tax exemption. The reason you're mad is because Paul Weyrich wanted to ensure that churches could continue to take advantage of the government and not pay taxes because, yeah, money. So you're mad because churches wanted more money. Abortion wasn't even considered a hot button issue until the late 1970s. And keep in mind, Roe v. Wade was enacted in 1973. So why then the late 1970s? Okay, so in 1976, there was a court case that basically said, hey, private religious schools, if you don't integrate your schools, you will not receive federal monies. And also for institutions that were trying to remain segregated, you would lose your tax exemption status. Churches did not like that. They tried to say that we want to make sure that we have our religious freedoms, but freedom to do what? Freedom to continue to segregate. And so again, there was always a threat, hey, integrate or else. And then they fucked around and found out. So in 1976, uh, Bob Jones University was hit with a loss of their tax ex exempt status in the Runyon versus McCrary case because they would not integrate their school. And so that caused everybody to just lose their shit. 
including Paul Weyrich. And so they said, what are we going to do to continue to have the pool with conservatives that we've so enjoyed until the stupid Civil Rights Act passed and now we have to do things we don't want to do, integrate our schools and our churches? Yeah, okay, so we'll try to then say, hey, this is a, an attack on our religious freedom. And that didn't really work. Nobody really got behind them. And then they tried to say, oh, well, they're going to force you to integrate your schools and everything. And, and that was happening anyway. So they couldn't really latch on to that as an issue. So then they said, oh, wow, there's this new decision that was made, Roe versus Wade, that seems to be a hot enough issue where we can claim the moral high ground. In fact, I think Paul Ray Rich is who coined that term moral majority. And yeah, so that's something where we can get on our high horse about it and use that to maintain control over the political space without losing our tax-exempt status. So we can still, again, have control over politicians, have control over the conservatives in particular, without risking the government ire for not following the rules of integration and of civil rights. And so that's what they did. That's what they did. In 1978, they specifically shifted to acting like abortion was so bad and that they didn't like it. And that. And I'm telling you, this wasn't even a thing. It wasn't even a thing. And so it's just crazy to me. But yeah, so by 1978, leaders like Jerry Falwell were starting to really focus heavily on abortion. These big mega churches started to make it a thing. And so... Now, it had been contentious. It had been contentious, but not even to that big of a degree. I was listening to Lawrence O'Donnell on MSNBC, and he was talking about how his Catholic mother got a DNC. It was just a DNC. It was just part of your health care. And so back in the day before Roe versus Wade, again, it wasn't even an issue, really. And so the fact that the whole abortion debate, the whole pro-life, pro-choice debate is not even as old as my big brother. <laughs> this is very new. I want to talk to you a little bit more about the whole church and the evangelical space. And again, feel free to interrupt me at any time with a comment or a question. But yeah. So no holy book is against abortion. Not one. And let me show you another video. I invited a Catholic, a Muslim, and a Jew to a bar to talk about abortion. Abortion. Let's start with a really easy question. Whose religion is right? I'm just kidding. Is God opposed to abortion? There's no ban on abortion in Islam. There is no ban on abortion at any point for any reason by any method. No All right. Okay. On abortion. In, in Judaism, mm -hmm. abortion is permitted. And where the pregnant person's life is at stake, it's required because the health and well-being of the pregnant person comes first. Okay. Jamie. Mm -hmm. A little more complicated. <laughs> Bad news. Well, let's bear in mind that what I'm about to say is a teaching created by men who are ostensibly celibate, mm -hmm. who have no inroads or connection to the lives of women because they do not have wives, they do not have daughters. Great start. Yeah. And the Catholic Church teaches that in almost every circumstance, abortion is murder. Is it in the Bible? No. In the Christian scriptures, there is no mention of abortion. I mean, does everyone just think that these things are mentioned and we're all just like misremembering? Is it like a Berenstain Bears thing? Yeah. So in the three major religions of our world, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, there's no mention in their holy books and in, in Judaism and in, in Islam, their religions don't have any restrictions on abortion. So it's one of those things where it's, okay, well, again, where did this come from? The late 1970s is where it came from, for America anyway. So let's see. So also the Bible. The, okay, this is crazy. This is weird. So let me just talk to you a little bit about 
the Bible and its stance on abortion. <laughs> so when it comes to abortion, it's only mentioned in one place in the Bible. And that's Numbers 5, 11 through 21. And it's basically a how-to guide on how to perform an abortion if you suspect your wife has cheated on you. So the only instance of actual abortion being talked about in the Bible is a how-to-do-it. It's a how-to guide. It's stupid. It's get ashes off the floor of the church and mix them in something and have her drink it. And it's disgusting. But, but it exists. That is a real thing. And then furthermore, God kind of performs abortions himself. <laughs> I'm laughing, but it's so ridiculous. So in Hosea 9-11, Hosea says, God, give them a miscarrying womb, the people from Ephraim, and dry breasts. Ephraim is smitten. Their root is dried up. They shall bear no fruit. And God's, yeah, okay, sure. So God basically makes all the unborn children die. So he performs like a mass abortion for the uh, poor city of Ephraim at Hosea's request. <laughs> it's fucked up. And so the guy is down with doing abortions. He gives you the how-to on how to do it. And there's more. In, in Hosea 13, 16, God promises to dash to pieces the infants of Samaria and that their women with child shall be ripped up. And he does it. So he kills pregnant mothers. Thanks, God. You have in Numbers 31, 17, where he's talking to Moses and he says, Now therefore kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman that hath known man by lying with him. In other words, if the woman might be pregnant, kill her. In 2 Kings 15, 16, God allows the pregnant women of Tapua to be ripped open. And so this is just God killing unborn babies. <laughs> There's so many more instances of him actually killing suckling infants and slaughtering little babies and dashing infants upon the rocks. And then he murders actual kids. So God, God don't care. Your Christian God doesn't care. Not at all. And so again, you have to think about where all this animosity and hatred towards abortion came from. And so do your homework, look into it, look it up. And like I said, Paul Weirich, who co-founded the Heritage Foundation, this is in the late 1970s. So now today we're talking about Project 2025 and that the Heritage Foundation has created this 900-page roadmap for the next conservative president. And it's not new, though. Like, they've been doing this and controlling and guiding the American legal and political landscape since before the late 1970s. So just think about it. Just think on it and really search yourself when it comes to this kind of stuff. So yeah, another thing about God and abortion is God gave us abortion, right? Isn't that amazing that if a woman is miscarrying, that we have these incredible doctors who know how to help her navigate this incredibly difficult time, or if a woman has children already and she now is worried about another mouth to feed when she's maybe in a financial situation that would ruin everybody by adding another child. It, God gave her the ability to rectify the situation for herself. So isn't that amazing? I'm not a believer, but if you are, like, how do you not think that God gave you abortion as a beautiful tool to help women? I mean, that's how I would see it. So, yeah, that's me. Are you enjoying what you're hearing so far? Oh, that makes me so happy. So give us a like if so, and back to the video. <laughs> the slippery slope of pro-life thinking, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, if this is something you feel or believe in, but the slippery slope, according to the pro-life movement, is that if you allow women to get abortions after six weeks or after 15 weeks and they'll do it 
all the way till the day of delivery and at eight months and 25 days, they'll get an abortion or even worse, they'll have the baby and let the baby die. And it's no, first of all, that there's no evidence of that. There's no even anecdotal evidence of that ever happening. There's no doctor that would allow that to happen. It just, it doesn't happen. But what does happen is when you ban abortions, and again, like that woman in South America who had to deliver her baby that she knew was going to die, she had to grow it to a point where it could feel things and then allow it to suffocate over the course of five days. That is fucking evil to me. That's what happens when you put restrictions on abortion. There's no slippery slope of women suddenly choosing at the last minute that they don't want to be parents. And so they're going to abort their baby right before they give birth. It's just so ludicrous to me. But even apart from that, the real slippery slope that exists with these bans is that you're starting with Roe versus Wade being overturned. But next, you got uh, Clarence Thomas out here saying that the Supreme Court should now reconsider opinions protecting same-sex relationships, marriage equality, and access to contraceptives. And that's dumb as fuck because Clarence Thomas is a black man whose wife is a white woman. And just a few years before Roe v. Wade, which he overturned, there was a case called Loving versus Virginia, which finally allowed for interracial marriage. So this idiot, he's opening the door for he and his best friend to have to split up. It's just stupid. So anyway, for him to talk about a slippery slope of what women will do, and yet he's out here now promising to make it difficult for people to even get contraception and then to renege on the same-sex marriages that have been performed and to not allow them again in the future. This also speaks to trans rights. This also speaks to, again, just so many other things when it comes to like gay people adopting kids. There's so much that is, is the real slippery slope here that we need to watch out for. So yeah, we have to be careful. We have to vote for Kamala Harris. Okay. So just to keep going. Unwanted babies are wanted by someone. They want them here for something. Let's take a look at a couple of maps really quickly. I want to show you something. Now, these are red states, blue states, split states. Have a look at where the red states are. And then have a look at the states that depend most on federal monies. So it's a big overlap, isn't it? So the red states, basically, they get more federal assistance. So, so the taxes that come from the blue states get basically shunted over to these greedy ass red states who suck it up. And so what happens is when you have leadership in a state that says, essentially, we don't care that we're last place in education because that gets us more money. That gets us more federal funding. We don't care if we're last place when it comes to our medical institutions because that gets us more money. We get more federal dollars. We don't care if we're last place when it comes to crime because we get more federal dollars. We get more, more criminal justice money. We get more federal money. So there's a reason that some of these states don't care that they're producing more unwanted kids who will statistically drive up crime, drive down education, drive up medical expenditures. It's insane. And so there's, again, benefits to some of the more negative aspects of this for somebody in almost all of these instances. Furthermore, their livestock for the rich, basically white babies and desirable babies, are livestock. There's a book called Before We Were Yours about basically children getting kidnapped and adopted to rich or, or wealthy people for it was just a ridiculously horrible situation but this is what's what they want 
there's actually been a, a misunderstanding around this phrase of domestic stock. Amy Coney Barrett is being falsely attributed with saying that we need to eliminate Roe versus Wade so that we'll have more domestic stock or, or domestic children for people to adopt. And although she didn't say those exact words, she's still a bitch because she she definitely has said that with safe haven laws and things like that, if an, if an abortion is banned at 20 weeks, she should just carry on for another 15, 16 weeks and then put the baby in a safe haven spot, like in a, in a fire department or a Chick-fil-A or something like that, which is insane to me. So, so even though she didn't say those exact words about Roe versus Wade and the domestic stock, she still has that sentiment. And it's true. I mean, where that phrase even came from was the CDC issued a report that said that like almost a million families want to adopt, but that there's really no stock for babies that are newborn or less than a month old. And so it's, there's still this prevailing sentiment that we need more children that are adoptable. And so the desirable kids, that's what they want. The white kids, essentially, let's not mince words here. That's what they want more of for those people. And then on the flip side of it, the more people that you have that are expendable, that's who you have to do your low-wage, low-skill jobs. That's who you have to send to the military. And so in their minds anyway, I don't put that kind of value placement on humans the way that it seems these people do, but they do. That's who they feel, oh, we need more of so that we can keep the machine of our government and the machine of our country going have a lot of cogs in it that are, again, expendable, I guess, is their thinking. So it's just sad. It's just really sad. But that's where we are. Yeah. So with, yeah, it's got me just, I hate it. I hate it. So if you're somebody who, again, if you're pro-life, if really look at why you get so upset about these things, this is why it's not even for you. It's so these other people can benefit. So the churches don't have to lose their tax exempt status. So religious people can, who want to have power can still have their hooks into the conservative political system so that they can use you to, in your ire, to pass and change and revoke laws and decisions that have even further reaching implications for people so that they can basically ensure that there's enough people to adopt for people who want them and that there's enough people for the military and for low skilled jobs and things like that. It's not, it's insane. It's not because they give a shit about life. It's not because they care about this baby's life. <laughs> they don't. So you know who else does? Donald Trump. He is not your protector. He is not your protector. He is not your protector. To say that, oh, he's going to come in and he's going to sign a national abortion ban, that's a good thing. It's not a good thing. He's say, he is saying now that he wouldn't, but that's part of Project 2025, who again backs him and is who creates his policies. So J.D. Vance, who's next in line after this 78-year-old man was put into office. Yeah, that's scary. J.D. Vance, who wants a national abortion ban. Trump doesn't care. In fact, when his wife or his uh, girlfriend at the time, Marla, I think it was pregnant, he was recounting on the Howard Stern show that she told him, oh, I'm pregnant. And he was like, oh, well, what do you want to do about that? So Trump was very much pro-abortion <laughs> when it suits him. But now all of a sudden he can go from being so proud of overturning Roe versus Wade and putting the three justices in who allowed him to do that to now saying, oh, I will protect you and I'm for IVF and I'm for all these things. It's, no, you're not. No, you're not. As a matter of fact, to say he's pro-IVF when we have situations like what happened in Alabama because of the revocation of Roe versus Wade, where embryos were given personhood status. So now people can't even do IVF, which 
he doesn't even know stands for in vitro fertilization, which means that people who want to have kids who are infertile or cannot have kids biologically can grow their families. Like it's not about family values if you stop IVF. It makes no sense. So yeah, Donald Trump is not your protector. He's not your protector. If you disagree, let me know why. I genuinely would like to know. I've I've been watching some videos from people who are going to vote for him and they say that it's because we're better off. We were better off under him than we are now. And it's like, no, we're not. We're really not, especially not women, especially not people who are capable of getting pregnant. Trans men, non-binary people who might still have uteruses. Yeah, it's crazy out here. So (laughs) another thing I have a question for you, if you're conservative, how is it conservative to decrease constitutional rights? How is it conservative to desire that the government expands its power in this way? Isn't the Republican Party supposed to be about small government and eliminating the overreach of government, and yet you're letting them reach into people's doctor's offices and into their bodies and their wombs? It's just make it make sense. Please like comment. Let me know what, how you can possibly hold these diametrically opposing things in your thinking. Yeah. So let's move on. We talked about your understanding. We talked about your anger. Let's talk about your fears. I want to very seriously run down what I found to be the top 10, I think, things that pro-life people are concerned about. And I really want to take it seriously. So I'm not going to do too much moving away from this point. We're just going to chat about your fears and why you potentially um, feel the things that you do. We've talked about who benefits from that. But yeah, let's just go one by one. All right. So your number one fear that I'm hearing is that you're concerned that you are murdering a baby that you're murdering a baby. That does sound really bad if you say it like that or if you feel like that's what's happening. Let's break it down. It's not a baby. A baby is a born child. We talked about how there's no instance of a baby being born and being left to die, except for the cases where women who are forced to deliver non-viable pregnancies where the babies got anencephaly or a situation where they are definitely going to pass. They're not viable outside of the womb. In those situations where they're forced to be delivered, it's pretty abhorrent. Those babies are left to die. And the moms, of course, love them. And especially their wanted babies, they have to watch their children suffer in that way. It's awful. But as far as abortions are concerned, elective abortions, it doesn't happen where a woman is that far along and makes that decision. Again, there's less than 1% of abortions that are done after 21 weeks. So nobody's getting to week 30 anything, you know, let alone close to 40 and having an abortion. So it, it doesn't happen. It's not a baby. It's a fetus. It's a blastocyst. It's an embryo. It's a fetus. And then again, even once it becomes a viable fetus, there are still options to have an abortion that could save the life of that fetus. So you're not murdering a baby. Even when it comes to the word murder, to murder someone is to take the life of a person and Fetuses are not persons. They're not people. So again, once you once they reach that 22, 23, 24 week mark where they have sentience, at that point, the life of the baby should be considered. Abortions that are non-fatal should be attempted. But before that point, you're not, it's not murder. You're not killing a child. You're not killing a baby. So just Take everything that we've talked about today, all the the research I've cited and showed, 
And I hope that makes you feel a little better. It's you're, It's not murder. It's not a baby. You genuinely don't have to have that fear. If you still do, I'd love to know why and what your thoughts are about it. Definitely leave a comment or write to me at some point. And we can chat about it further. But for the most part, I hope that we've outlined just why this fear is completely unfounded. Okay. Let's move on to fear number two. There's a fear that they will eventually be a baby. So you're concerned that, well, yeah, it's not a human life now, but it will be one day. Thing is, you don't know that. You genuinely don't know that. A third of pregnancies end naturally before the first trimester. So it's not even a guarantee that this baby will be born. And then also what you're looking at is the fallacy of potentiality is what they call it, where it's, oh, just because something could happen, I'm going to treat it in its present state as if it were in its future state. And it's just not logical. It's not something that people do. For instance, I have a five-year-old. I don't go out and buy her alcohol because she'll eventually be 21 years old. I don't buy her cigarettes because she'll eventually be 18 years old. You just don't think that way. And that's another reason why like, I think, I hate to say this and that, this is pure conjecture on my part, but I think that's why there's so much pedophilia in the church because it's that same thinking that a child being in its current child state isn't really respected because, oh, their age ain't nothing but a number, that kind of thing. Yeah, no. Kids, <laughs> pedophilia, statutory rape are bad things <laughs> because you're harming the child in its present childlike state. So it's the same thing. If fetus is six weeks, 15, 20 weeks old. They're not sentient. They're, they're not in a place to be considered like a baby because they are not a baby even though eventually they may be, that, that's not the current present state. So I really and genuinely hope allaying some of your fears around, again, that sort of fallacy of potentiality, it's just not anything to worry about, okay? So <laughs> let's move on to fear number three. This is a fear that this baby that you're killing could be who cures cancer. This could be our next Einstein. You know, it could be the next Hitler. I hate to say it could be the next Mussolini. You can't use this argument because it could go both ways. Maybe it's best we not try to ascribe greatness to a, a kid that's not even here because they could be great in a negative way or have a huge impact on the world in a way that you might not intend. So, especially if you're forcing someone to have a baby when it, it would be unwanted. It would be putting a financial strain on that family that they might not be as well nourished. They, they're, you're basically creating a bunch of villain origin stories, which is horrible. So, so don't think about it that way. Think about it as, again, that law of potentiality. We don't know who or what this baby or, or fetus or embryo is going to be. So we can't operate on this future thinking. We have to look at who and what they are right now. Furthermore, nothing has ever happened of import because of one person. So we say, oh, Einstein, but the theories of relativity and, the, and his amazing scientific contributions happen because of so much other research and so many other people's thinking and so many other physics experiments and things like that. So when it comes to cancer, there's so many organizations and people and schools and universities and labs working on this problem. Take somebody like Thomas Edison. Well, what if Thomas Edison was aborted and he never invented the light bulb? It was already invented. <laughs> he just filed the patent for it before other people did. In fact, he a lot of his inventions were based on work other people had done or people that he paid to uh, do things. So nothing is done uh, as an island. So you, you don't have to worry that 
removing one human will affect all of humanity. It's just not how anything, again, of import has ever happened. So don't worry about it. I hope that helps to alleviate your fear. There, fear number three. So let's move on to fear number four. Oh, that baby could have been adopted. There's a fear that you're exploiting that pregnant person that she might not have known or they might not have known their options. So then you see these places that spring up right next to Planned Parenthoods and right next to abortion clinics that try to trick women into thinking they're going to get assistance with their pregnancy. And they really are like these Christian backed organizations that A, misinform women and try to tell them, oh, abortion means you're never going to be able to have another kid. And abortion means this and this, that they're doing this to the baby and it has a heartbeat. And this. they lie to these women to scare them into not getting an abortion. And then they provide zero assistance when that person does have a baby. And it's awful. So they just feel like they got a win if they brought a life into this world, but they have no thought as to how that baby's quality of life is going to be. So you have that kind of thing. So, so the fear of pregnant people being exploited because they don't know their options is actually being realized by these very people. It's wild. So please, please, please know that's not the case. I'd say when it comes to a person walking into an abortion clinic, they already know those their options. They know that they could adopt that baby. They know that there's probably somebody who would raise that child, but that's not what's best for them. And it's already a very hard decision to make in the first place. So to steer someone away from that without giving them adequate assistance if they do choose to have their baby is pretty fucking evil. It's pretty bad. So yeah, another thing is pregnant people who are considering that perhaps they don't want to be a mom right now or it very just elective abortions. Not everybody chooses that option. So even without abortion bans, there's still going to be women who, knowing that logically it's not a baby, legally it's not murder, technically and in actuality this is a fetus, even knowing that, they'll still want to deliver that baby. There's never going to be women who don't adopt out their kids. It's just not going to happen. There's, there's always going to be people who want to take that baby to, to term. It's just impossible to assume that. Even for the cases where there are non-viable babies, they don't always choose abortion. There's a woman named Carrie Young who lives in Oklahoma. She knew at 19 weeks that her baby was uh, going to die, that she didn't have a brain. Her name was Ava Grace. And she chose to carry her baby to term so that she could allow her baby to donate her organs to other little babies who might need a kidney or pancreas or lungs. I think the lungs had to go to research, if I'm not mistaken, but still, that's incredible. That's incredible. So just because abortion is an option doesn't mean it's the option that everybody's going to choose. Okay, so I hope that helps to alleviate that fear. There's even with the Amy Coney Barrett CDC comments about the stock for adoptions and stuff. I, I think that's just I think that's a good problem to have. I think the less babies that are unwanted that exist out there, the better. So it sucks that every person who wants to build their family by adopting a baby can't do that. But isn't that beautiful that if we got to a place where everybody who wanted their kids could keep their kids and who didn't want their kids didn't have to consider that they're bringing a child into this world and they're not going to know what happens to them or if they go to a place that is actually a healthy, thriving home. So well, I think it would be a good thing if we kept the stock of adoptable babies down. What's wrong with that? 
So let's move on to your next fear. And I really hope that fear number four has been addressed. If you still, again, have questions and concerns, please let me know. I want you at sexwithsophie.com so we can continue these conversations. Come on. Sexwithsophie.com. All right, back to the video. Fear number five is the fear that you're harming the pregnant person harming them physically. There's this thinking that the more abortions you get, the harder it's going to be to have a child. That's absolutely not true. There's no evidence. There's no medical research that shows that having multiple or several abortions decreases or diminishes your chance of having a child at all. On the other side of that coin, though, forcing women to give birth, especially if they have to have the hysterotomy abortion or either a cesarean section, that could, that's what hurts your chances of having another child or being able to carry a child, especially the, the late term hysterotomy abortions. Those are, your uterus cannot contain babies well after that. So it's just, it's, that's what's hurting women more than anything is by not allowing them to have an abortion. So physically, um, you're not harming the pregnant person and keeping these bands in place is harming physically the pregnant person. Now, mentally, there's a fear that you're uh, causing them all this distress. And yeah, it's a distressing thing. Nobody enjoys going to get an abortion. It's not something anybody wants to do. Can you imagine that? <laughs> there's all these jokes about, oh, we're going to have an abortion party. And Hey, what you doing this weekend, girl? Let's go get an abortion. Nobody does that. Nobody on earth does that. It's a painful thing to have to do mentally. Research shows that 90% of women who obtain an abortion report feeling relief. Now, here's where we talked earlier about how two things can be true at one time. That same study that showed that 90% of women who obtain a near limit abortion reported feeling relief, 41% of those, that same group of women did feel regret. So you can feel regretful that you had to have an abortion, but still know that almost, what, 90% of those women still were relieved to be able to have, been able to do it. So yeah, there's ambivalence there for sure. But it, it, that's why it's necessary, because it's not something people take lightly. It's not something that people just do on a whim. Another study shows that 99% of women who had abortions said that they felt they made the right choice in terminating their pregnancies up to three years later. 99%. And that tracks with that 90% of immediately after feeling relief. Mentally, it's challenging. It's difficult. People, again, up to 41% in this study can feel regretful. But most women, a great, huge amount of women, 99% feel that they made the right choice. So why take that choice away from them, especially if it's not harming them mentally? So again, hopefully we're alleviating some fear, taking away some tension around your thinking with this. Let's move on to the next one. And this is actually something I'm new to hearing. This is new to me, but it makes sense that you feel like you're wasting a soul or that a spirit is not having a chance to manifest itself. I'm personally an atheist. I don't believe in souls and spirits, but I think it's beautiful that I can apply my kind of scientific mind to an esoteric problem. So if energy cannot be created or destroyed, and people tend to describe a soul as being a type of energy, if you think about a, a, a baby that is in the womb and either doesn't make it and needs to be aborted or the pregnant person feels that they need to end that pregnancy at whatever stage that soul was at 
it, it's not going away. Energy cannot be destroyed. So it's just going back to the pool of souls that it came from. It just didn't get a chance to manifest its life on earth, but it's not going away because energy cannot be destroyed. So it's like how people say, oh, what happens when you die? It's the same thing that happened before you were born. Do you remember any of that? Do you have any recollection of it? No. So I think it's the same with the soul, perhaps. I hate to say it, but I feel silly talking about it just because, I again, it's like me talking about angels and Santa Claus and fairies. But I really hope that just if I could take it as a truth and try to understand that's your truth and let's take that seriously, then again, yeah, energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed or altered. So it, it's going right back to the pool of souls that it came from. So I'm hoping that applying some scientific thinking to this fear can help to alleviate it. But yeah, so yeah, I hope that helps a little bit. Let's move on to fear number seven. And let's talk about how some people fear that allowing pregnant people to have abortions can ruin the moral fabric of society. Now we talked about how religion has no thoughts about abortion other than that God enjoys doing them as far as a moral fabric of society. Now there's a theory of economics from a book called Freakonomics that the reason behind the, the severe drop in crime in the early 80s, late 80s, was because of Roe versus Wade. If you hold all things to be equal, that the rate of hiring cops, the rate of investment in criminal justice, the rate of, I don't know, all those things were held equal. The only variable that they could find that indicated that the reduction in crime was occurring about eight, 16 to 18 years after Roe versus Wade was because it provided women an, an option to, to end a pregnancy that might have otherwise ended with a person being born who they did not want, could not care for, who had to fall between the cracks of society, perhaps. So it's one of those things where correlation and causation are such difficult things to actually uh, determine. But for the most part, it tracks. It tracks. Freakonomics is the first time I think I was like, oh, wow, that there's a, an interesting thing to maybe unpack there. And so when we think about the moral fabric of society, if you have groups of children out there who are, again, unwanted, where they are on the poorer side. I saw a statistic that 42% of um, people who are seeking abortions are at or below the poverty line. It makes sense. It makes sense. If you're unable to pull yourself out of these economic disparities and you're trying to raise a child in that, you're perhaps having to work more jobs to support a child that you didn't want, unfortunately. I could see how that could mentally lead that child into maybe gang culture or criminality or drug usage or things like that. So yeah, I could see how abortion bans could actually do more to harm society and the moral fabric of society than not having them. So that's just something to think about. It's a great book to read if you're curious to learn more. But another thing that, that happens is we try to say, oh, well, all life is important and all life is valuable. No, we have to start ascribing the most value to the pregnant person. That's the living, breathing, existing person who not only it's their body that is providing the ability for this creature to grow. But but if they are to terminate their pregnancy, they can have another one. So it's like you're not only 
by forcing a woman and potentially killing a woman who is unready to have a baby or who has complications from a wanted pregnancy, you're eliminating her and the baby. But if the just the baby is not in the picture, then the woman can still have more babies. It's almost like why take away the golden goose, if you will? <laughs> You're not going to get any of those eggs of the golden eggs. So it's obviously getting way too late. It's 6.45 in the morning where I am. So <laughs> let's keep going. But I hope you take my meaning. Like the moral fabric of society will be just fine. Better even if women are allowed to raise children in a financially sustainable house. Not only that, but think about this. A lot of pregnancies are electively ended due to a woman finding out that the person she was in a relationship with might have been abusive. They might have been narcissistic. They might have been cheating. They might have presented themselves to be one way, but once they thought they trapped her with the pregnancy, they totally showed their true colors. With an abortion ban, you're forcing not only this woman to continue in a relationship that could potentially end her life in itself, now you're putting a child in that situation. So there's so many myriad reasons why people have abortions that we just don't know every single instance and we can't account for it in a way that would, I think, do anything for the moral fabric of society. I think it's more moral to allow a woman an out from a relationship that could hurt her or kill her. In fact, the biggest reason for women dying in pregnancy is murder. Crazy. It's crazy. So the most dangerous part about being pregnant is that your partner could kill you. That's insane. So look up these statistics. So again, think about the moral fabric of society and how that's based on a, a solid nuclear family. We need abortion so that women who are not in a safe family can exit that situation and not introduce a baby into that situation. That seems like the better thing to do for an innocent life than to, to force them into it. I do hope that offers some consolation, though, if that is a concern of yours. Let's move on to fear number eight, eugenics and ethnic holocausts. So I dated this guy for five years before I met my husband, and he was what is known as a hotep. <laughs> That's somebody who's like really militant and into Moorish sovereignty and things like that. And so you would hear in those circles all the time how abortion was so bad because it's creating a black holocaust because about 41% of all abortions are from black women. 21% are from Hispanic women. 30% are from white women. And so they're like, oh, all these abortions. Again, if we have about 600,000 abortions, a good 200 and something, almost 300,000 abortions are black babies, potentially, you know? So they're like, oh, there's this whole genocide and holocaust of black babies. And it's no, because not only are you allowing a woman to make the better choice for when she will grow her family, but over the last 24 years, there has been a population increase in the Black and Latino communities. So since the year 2000, the Black population has grown by 30%. The white population has decreased by half a percent. When it comes to Hispanic people, since 2000, their population has grown by 80%. So abortion has nothing to do with the decline in Black lives at all. So I genuinely hope that's something that people can feel a little bit more comfortable about. Everything's fine. We're still outpacing white people, if that's a concern of yours. 
you know. Um, when it comes to eugenics, there's all these thinkings that I'm hearing about how if your baby has some kind of genetic disorder or chromosomal disorder, that isn't it eugenics to abort that fetus before you have a child who has Down syndrome or some sort of, again, condition. I understand that perspective, but I have to disagree. And I have to disagree because I've worked so closely with special needs children, including children with Down syndrome, children who are born with neurological situations and learning disabilities of all sorts. When I worked at a school district, especially, you really get to see the day-to-day lives of some of your most vulnerable kids. And I would never do that to a kid intentionally, never do that to a baby intentionally. When I was pregnant, I made sure to do all the genetic testing, all the chromosomal (laughs) testing. Before we even got pregnant, we did all the testing to make sure that my husband and I wouldn't uh, have carriers and any kind of weird uh, combinations with our genes that could potentially harm our babies. So eugenics, eugenics is when you call unwanted variables in your population so that you can whittle down the what you consider the best of the best of your race. And that's not what it is when you're electing to terminate a pregnancy where the child will have some sort of debilitation or special need. Because in most of those cases, that child will not go on to have children themselves. So it's not like you're shaping the course of a particular group of people in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So when it comes to the whole eugenics argument, it's just not true. And when it comes to just the idea that it's not good to terminate pregnancies that will end up with a child having lifelong special needs, I think it's I think it's incredibly, incredibly difficult. It's a hard situation to be put in. Personally, I can only speak for myself in this, but personally, again, I could not do that to a child, but I also couldn't do it to my other child. So I have a five-year-old. I'm an older mom. I had my only biological child at 41 years old. So if I had a baby that needed care, I'm going to be saddling my five-year-old who would grow up to be the caretaker for this person after I'm gone, which is probably not long because, I'm again, I'm an older mom. So it's just all these considerations that you have to to think about. But yeah, so it's an individual decision. But ultimately, again, like we talked about before, just because abortion is an option, it's one I would absolutely take if that were the shoes that I was in. But not everybody does that. Not everybody uh, minds raising a child with Down syndrome or with some other issue. So in those cases, I do feel like it's horribly selfish to put a child through that and again to potentially put your other children through that if there are no other children then this poor baby who has special needs and needs you could potentially be a ward of the state if they don't have anybody to help them so it's it's a lot of considerations but they're not for me to make for anybody else they're only for me to make for myself so yeah moving on i hope that again helps you feel a little better that it's not the super crazy bad thing to to think about it and to have it in your arsenal of options. But yeah, let me know what you feel about it. And if you were presented with that situation, what you would do, or if you have a, a special needs child or adult in your life, what that looks like and what some of the considerations you have now, how they might have differed having that person in your life. Yeah, I'm interested to know. So leave a comment or write to me at some point and let me know what you think. Well, let's move on to fear number nine. Now, this is a fear that without a ban on abortion or limitations on abortion, that you're encouraging irresponsibility. That there's all these people out here who just use abortion as birth control. Let's remember that 
somewhere between 25 and 50 percent of all abortions are from failed contraception. It's not that people are out here using abortion as birth control when most of the time they were trying to use birth control and it just didn't work for them. Also, most women do not take abortion lightly. Uh, a lot of women who have to have abortions have wanted children. These are kids that they wanted and tried for. How is it irresponsible to do everything in your power to try to have a baby, but then medical complications or situations arise where you can no longer maintain a viable pregnancy? That's not your fault. That's not being irresponsible. But for, again, for the women who don't care and they don't use contraception and who cares if I get pregnant? I'll just get an abortion. Is that who you really want to be a mom? Is that who you really want to force to have a baby? What? Like, how horrible would that be for the poor baby? So I don't understand the, the thinking there. It's not something that I think you can separate from misogyny, unfortunately. I hate to say it, but for you to say, oh, if you're, you're just out here taking advantage of the system. Sometimes I think people say, oh, well, I'm paying my tax dollars to help subsidize your abortion. I, I disagree with that. It's no, you're not like you're not. It's such a it's such a tiny sliver of expenses that you can't attribute your concern about it being fiscal. So your concern is probably more that you want to punish women. You want to punish pregnant people for Again, what you deem to be irresponsibility. And that's horrible. That's a bad thing. So, yeah, just if that's your thinking, if that's where you're coming from, question yourself and think about if that's com coming from a place of misogyny. Furthermore, fear number 10 is a fear that the person who is pregnant is not accepting the consequences of their actions. It's in that same vein of, oh, you did this, so you should be punished for it. When in reality, you're not punishing the woman, you're pun punishing a, a little baby. So there's this thinking that women know that pregnancy is a consequence of sex. And so women shouldn't be having sex. <laughs> it's so silly to say. It's so silly to say. I mean, I know that car accidents are a consequence of driving a car. It doesn't mean I shouldn't drive my car. So you, again, it's one of those logical fallacies that when you really think about it, it doesn't make sense. So what does make sense is that you're probably, again, coming from a place of misogyny or coming from a place of, I hate to say it, but probably even hypocrisy where it's just your church or an evangelical preacher or somebody trying to tell you like, oh, it's a sin for women to have pleasure or to seek pleasure, or to have sex. And it's, no, that's just not true. It's just not true. It's just not true. It comes from a place of misogyny. So you really want to investigate that about yourself. Also, women are raped. Men are raped. Trans men are raped. Like it, it happens where if you have a uterus, you could have an unwanted pregnancy statutory rape. You have all these children out here who are forced to have babies. It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to me. How is that person not accepting the consequences of their actions when they were underage and couldn't make that decision or when they were raped and they couldn't make that decision for themselves? And again, just because abortion is an option doesn't mean it's an option that everybody takes. There's plenty of women who have experienced rape who still refuse to get an abortion. They, they still don't want to end a, a life, and that's their decision. But to take that decision away from them and away from the ones who are raped and don't want to carry that baby is just abysmal. It's just abysmal. We also have to remember that half of abortions occur from failed contraception. So it's not like you're not accepting the consequences of your actions when you actually try to be safe. Yeah, so this one and fear number 10, I think, go hand in hand. Also, there's only about a 5% chance that any healthy woman will get pregnant if she has sex one time. It's only like a 5% chance. And then that chance, I think it's 5 to 20% chance 
And then those chances decrease the more you try to have sex and have a baby. It's weird. And then your chances decrease as you get older. Your chances decrease with illness, disability, disease. Your chances decrease with syndromes like PCOS. If you're an athlete again. So it's very, it's actually really quite difficult to get pregnant. You saw the video earlier where there's so many things that have to happen perfectly. Even if the egg is fertilized just right, it, it might not leave the fallopian tube. And then you might have an ectopic pre pregnancy, which could happen anywhere. It doesn't have to just happen in the fallopian tube. You could have a baby in your digestive system. There's this thing called fetal and fetu, I think it's called, where a baby can grow in another fucking baby. Like there was a baby who literally was one years old and she started, her head started getting bigger because she had a fucking baby growing in her fucking skull. There's, this shit is crazy, man. So like, I'm telling you, like, if you just, there are so many reasons why people need to, or might need to have an abortion. We just can't know them all. So, so it's not that you're, again, not accepting the consequences of you having sex. It's that you just don't know what could happen or what's going to happen, even if you do engage in sex. It's not all the time that you're having sex. And you, again, you could be essayed. You could, there's all kind of things that could happen. You've hung in there this long. Thank you so much. It's almost to the end. So make sure you like this video before we get there. Thanks. All right, let's get back to it. So fear number 10 is my last one I'm going to address that I can think of. If you can think of any other fear around what's driving pro-life people to be as entrenched in their thinking as they are, or if you are pro-life and I have not addressed something that concerns you, please let me know. But I do feel like we've covered most of them or all of them that I could think of. So it's not about not accepting the consequences. It's not about being irresponsible. And again, even if it is, is that irresponsible woman who doesn't accept the consequences of her actions really who you want to force to have a child? How is that fair to that child? So let's recap a little bit. We've talked about your understanding of abortion. We talked about your anger around abortion. We've now talked about your fears when it comes to abortion. Let's talk about your hope with everything we've learned, everything we've talked about. What does the future look like? Where do we go from here now that you know more than you knew before we started? So first of all, I hope you feel better. I genuinely do. I hope that us having this really comprehensive deep dive into abortion, that you feel a little bit relieved that you being so angry is manufactured. Pro-choice is not being pro-abortion. Again, two things can be true at one time. So just because you want to give women the option doesn't mean that you are happy about it. It's not like everybody, again, wants an abortion. So ways that we can help to prevent the need for abortion, I think stems primarily with comprehensive sex education, letting people know ways that they can be safe, exactly how pregnancy occurs, that abstinence is not the best way. The pullout method is not the best way to prevent pregnancies. I think 22% of people who try the pullout method end up pregnant. Just the ability to teach people better will help there to be less instances of a need for abortion. I want to encourage more responsibility from men. I think if more men who know they don't want kids, just go ahead and get a vasectomy. That'd be a real good way to ensure that there's less unwanted babies out there. Wouldn't it be amazing if every man on earth, like there's this new TV show called uh, The Curfew or something where all these men in the UK are, are like forced to be tracked and you have to be in your house by like eight o'clock at night. That's an interesting theory, but what if we said every man, once you get to be like at the age of puberty, 
has to freeze their sperm and then get a vasectomy. <laughs> wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be the absolute best way to prevent unwanted pregnancies? Just saying, just saying. Now, doesn't that sound ridiculous? Isn't that crazy to think? So why is it always the onus of the woman when, yes, it's ridiculous to, to think that all men would give vasectomies, but that is a solution, is it not? So yeah, don't just put the onus on women. Furthermore, it's not like, you know, every young man who gets his girlfriend pregnant in high school ditches her. So a lot of times you end up with a little boy's life being just as shaken up by a, a teenage pregnancy as a little girl's. So in those respects, I think that we should encourage more responsibility from men and especially our young men. But men also have to deal with their wives and girlfriends and partners losing their life when it comes to some of these abortion bans. Little boys like Amber Thurman's six-year-old son no longer have a mother because of these abortion bans. Men are affected with reproductive rights just like women are. They are part of this too. So yeah, I want to encourage more input and responsibility from the felt. And just really briefly, because it is very early in the morning and I have to take my daughter to school in a second. But my abortion story is that I miscarried at seven weeks with my first IVF attempt. So this is a wanted baby who died in my womb at seven weeks. And I live in the UK. And so I was very fortunate to be able to the next day get a DNC. And so then literally 30 days later, <laughs> I flew to America and had a second round of IVF. And now I have my sweet baby day. So abortion is a beautiful thing. It allowed me to quickly grieve the loss of my seven-week-old and then honor her by having a rainbow baby in day. And so I feel like it's, it's a beautiful thing at the end of the day. It takes something where it was such a difficult and grievous time. I was so sad. And I had so much hope, though, because I knew, okay, I can very quickly get my DNC and then try again. And that's what abortion allowed me to do. So, yeah, I, if you have any questions or want to know more about my story, you can go to sophiepartlow.com and I have a blog and you can see what happened with all that. But for the most part, I'm always going to be an advocate because I know how it benefited me. Yeah. Now, instead of being pro-life, because from this moment forward, you've gotten all the data and the information and the quelling of your fears. You've got all that now. So now what we need to do is put our energies toward things that actually help children, that actually help babies, that actually help women and families. So first of all, you need to vote for Kamala Harris today. You need to vote for Kamala Harris. She's the only person out here hoping to enshrine reproductive rights into law. For everything that you have a concern about with the economy and Gaza and everything else, she's also the most qualified candidate to make some positive changes in those regards. But as it pertains to reproductive health, she's the only one who's going to ensure that, again, our right to abortion is enshrined in law. So vote for Kamala Harris, but also vote for the a Democratic Party down ticket. Those are the parties of social efforts that help with things like early childhood education, paid family leave, reduced child care costs. Kamala Harris wants to have a $6,000 child tax credit. They want to focus on paternity leave. That'd be amazing. If we, again, had more comprehensive sex education, if we have free school breakfast and lunch, more DEI programs, criminal justice reform, there's so many other things that we can be doing to assist 
black and brown kids to assist lower income kids. The child tax credit brought 50% of children out of poverty. And then the Republican Congress, they nuked it essentially, or they didn't pass a bill to, to keep it going. So this is where our efforts need to be going if we genuinely care about life and children and families and women. Okay. So finally, if you still don't support abortion after everything we've talked about today, just don't get one. Just don't get one. It's as simple as that. What's that though is, let me show you an article that you must read. It is imperative that you read it. It is called The Only Moral Abortion is My Abortion. And it talks about all the people who, doctors who worked at clinics would see picketing outside of the abortion clinic one day and then coming in to have an abortion the next day and then going right back out and picketing because it's just it just talks about the ambiguity of those people, them, they're the ones who are doing it for this reason. I'm getting an abortion because I slipped up or because I had a temporary lapse of judgment. It's the mental gymnastics that they do to justify their abortion being okay. And it's the same kind of thing, I think, unfortunately, that we talked about, where, again, if you just don't want one, just don't get one. But you should feel absolutely okay with getting one if you need one or if you want one. There's nothing wrong with them. It is a very hard decision, but it's okay for you that to be an option for you. It's not okay for you to then be hypocritical toward other people about it if you do choose to get one. So again, after everything we've talked about today, after everything we've discussed, let me just say that, I again, I know you're a good person. I know you are. I know you're a good person, but it is not in keeping with being a good person to want to punish women for having sex. It is not in keeping with being a good person to harass women who are trying to make the hardest decision they'll ever face. It is not in keeping with being a good person to be more concerned about an unborn child than an existing human person. So please vote for Kamala Harris because it is not in keeping. It is not in keeping with being a good person to vote for someone who will actively continue to root for policies that kill women. Okay. Are we simpatico? I hope so. And after all of this, honestly, if you still feel unmoved, if you still feel entrenched, please go to therapy talk to someone other than a minister, seek some professional guidance into in interrogating your misogyny, okay? Because it's, if it's been, what, th almost four hours we've been chatting here, if you are still of the mind that women should be punished, that it is wrong, that people are taking this lightly, that anybody wants to have to do this, then again, please interrogate your misogyny, okay? Otherwise, I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that you've learned a thing or two. I've had really enjoyed spending this night with you. And if you want to ask me a question that I will do a deep dive or research very thoroughly, just like I've done for you today, for my friend Jamie today, Go to withsophie.co or sexwithsophie.com slash ask-sophie. And I will very happily research your question and provide you with a video response. So that's it for me. I really am glad to have shared this information with you. But if you still have any questions or want to chat further on anything that I've talked about, Go to sexwithsophie.com and create a free membership so that you can join me in my community areas and our forum and our focus groups to discuss this further. And again, just would like to thank you and would like to, to extend my invitation to follow me or subscribe so that you can see when we go 
live and and have her call in shows, which are damn near daily, for you to call in and have a chat with me directly. So, in the meantime, thanks for hanging out on this live, this incredibly long live. Oh my gosh. And good luck with the polls tomorrow, America. Please go vote. And again, please go vote for Kamala Harris. I've already voted absentee way back in October. I want to say, yeah, September. So, yeah, lock it in, get it done. Let's win for democracy. Let's win for women's rights. <laughs>